Hello, good evening. I uh, want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed dinner. I uh, will just have a few announcements and then we'll get started with our with our meeting. Um, so uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Bradley Golden with IMRS, uh, professor at Webb Institute. Uh, tonight, we, while this is a joint meeting of SNAMI, IMRS, uh, ASNI, and SMPE, this meeting is hosted uh, by, the, by IMRS, and our presentation is going to be on opportunities for marine sequestration of carbon dioxide, presented by Chris Barry. And he's the chairman of SNAMI's Ocean Renewable uh, Energy Technology and Research Panel. Special thanks to SUNY Maritime College for hosting us. Uh, as well as the, uh, the colleges, SNAMI, and IMRS student section. Uh, it's, it's been very good to have you here. Thank you very much for, for everything you've done. Uh, and, and hopefully this will help bring uh, the, the, not only the, the colleges together, but also help bring uh, the, the SUNY Maritime students closer to SNAMI and IMRS, even at our, at our meetings, uh, other meetings around the region. Uh, uh, Chris has also been very kind enough to prepare handouts for this uh, based, on, based on the PowerPoint that he's prepared. Uh, that I will be distributing that to each of the uh, individual leaders of the societies, and it will also be on the IMRS website for anyone who's interested in downloading after the fact. Okay, so let me introduce our presenter and uh, give you a brief summary, and then uh, I'll pass the mic to him. Uh, so, uh, Chris Barry, he's a 1974 graduate of UC Berkeley in mechanical engineering and naval architecture and a uh, licensed professional engineer in Maryland, Washington, and California. He's worked on a wide variety of projects throughout his career, including projects involving amphibious vehicles, commercial cargo vessels, ferries, fishing vessels, tankers, naval auxiliaries, uh, coast guard boats and cutters, offshore oil platforms and drilling vessels, and ocean alternative energy systems. Uh, he also worked on the ocean thermal energy conversion, early ocean test platform, one, uh, one megawatt, uh, which sparked his long interest in alternative ocean energy. He holds two patents in high-speed hydrofoil craft design, a patent pending in wave energy conversion, and he's a co-author of the 1997 uh, SNAMI Han Award paper uh, in ship production, and he's a fellow of SNAMI. Uh, Chris is currently the chair of SNAMI's Small Craft Technical uh, and Research Committee and the co-chair of the Technical and Research Panel EC12 on renewal, Ocean Renewable Energy, uh, and he would be pleased to hear from volunteers interested in either activity. He's now a naval architect in the naval architecture section of the Coast Guard Surface Forces Logistics Center in Baltimore, concentrating on boats and small cutters. Uh, and, uh, you know, Chris, let me just pass it on to you right now, and uh, I'll let you talk about the paper. So, Mr. Barry. Okay. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is a, a particular area of technology that's kind of dear to my heart. I have to apologize for the fairly wordy slides, but the point is to document them, document what's going on so people can refer to it later. And thank you, Bradley, for putting this up so people can look at this. At the end of the handouts are about two and a half, three pages of references, most of which are free online. The last reference, though, is another one that is of particular interest to this subject. It's the um, science fiction novel, The Deep Range, by Arthur C. Clarke, which postulates an ocean, ocean world of... Uh, kelp farming and similar. Anyway, um, I once described a presentation on this subject as an amuse-bouche, which is if you're a foodie, that's the little uh, treat the chef give, gives you while you're waiting for your main meal. And you don't pay for it, he just brings it out. But So this presentation, though, is more like either a tasting menu or dim sum or perhaps one of those all-you-can-eat buffets where there's a whole bunch of stuff that isn't actually very good, but you have a hard time deciding what to eat. Um, you know, I'm thinking country buffet here. Uh, and, but I do hope to spur your appetite for more, um, more interest in this area. The initial in, in, uh, uh, inspiration of this goes back to the Carter administration when I was working in ocean thermal energy. And I was wondering what would happen to all that cold water that the ocean thermal energy plant um, produced. A few years later, a long time later, Someone asked me to do a presentation as part of a job interview. And I said, well, you know, I didn't really need the job. I said, let's do something fun. So I said, how to save the world. Um, that was kind of an interesting little presentation. And then um, John Snyder, of Maritime Reporter, Marine Log, whichever one it is, the smaller one, asked me to do something at the last minute for one of his things. And I've, so I've been developing this. But it's a very interesting subject, and I think it's important for our industry. Um, 
Hey, which one is it? Always. <coughs> or the other one? Nope. That's not it. There we go. There we go. So what a, as a bit of background, I want to talk about the basis of global, for global warming in general, and then talk about carbon sequestration in particular, um, which is kind of a, a Hail Mary play, for, you know, for football fans, it, where you try to win the game in the last, last quarter by a desperate pass. And that's what we need to do is make a desperate pass to prevent catastrophic climate change. The key issues here are possible options for, for gathering up carbon and hiding it somewhere, in this case in the ocean. And oceanic processes include both physical methods and biological methods to enhance natural sequestration. And in any, uh, any engineering project, both economics and a lot of little details are very important. But if any of these processes do work, they'll require major marine infrastructure, which is where we come in. The greenhouse effect was first discovered by the Fourier, the same as the Fourier series. And the Scottish uh, physicist Tindale, John Tyndale discovered the role of carbon dioxide and water vapor. Then in 1890, Arrhenius uh, did a lot of very extensive calculations, so extensive that his girlfriend left him, and found that doubling CO2 would result in about a seven to nine degree Fahrenheit rise in the Earth's temperature. He was Swedish, so he thought this was a good idea. Um, the, the thing is, is that the Earth and the sun have to be in thermal equilibrium. And in order to do that, the Earth heats up until it radiates enough energy to balance the incoming radiation. The sun radiates at this no as a black body roughly at this number, 5,700 5, Kelvin. And the, therefore, the peak wavelength of the, of the gas is coming in are about six micrometers. The Earth radiates at a much lower temperature, which we've probably noticed. It's a fairly low, low temperature that it radiates at. And this gives a peak wavelength around 10 micrometers or so. And the problem is diatomic molecules like oxygen can only bounce one way. There's a spring between them, two masses, and so they have one mode of vibration. But carbon dioxide has two, so it can vibrate in a large number of different ways. Likewise, uh, methane with four more modes. Each mode absorbs energy. So you have many modes. They're at lower frequencies, mainly because of the combination of the mass and the spring. Just simple vibration engineering. And we can repeat Arrhenius's calculation to show that we're Earth is, would be at about minus 18 degrees centigrade, basically zero Fahrenheit without the greenhouse effect. So it's not a bad thing. It's necessary. And if we had, you know, if we look at historic at levels of CO2, about 280 parts per million, and say the Earth is about 10 degrees C on average, and then look at current levels, which are roughly 2390, and draw a line from 0 at 18 to 10 at 290 and extend that out to 380. Uh, in the words of the, that famous dog detective, Scooby-Doo, ruh row, we're in trouble. So here we have a little more analytical thing, the spectrum themselves. The sun radiates in the yellow, and those various things are various lines are helium and calcium and all the other hot elements in the sun. The red is what comes through the atmosphere. And there's some high frequency oxygen bands, some high frequency components of water, probably the direct bounce frequencies. There's various water bands and the first CO2 band way down here. When, but if we look at the Earth radiating as a black body, if we line this up, this is 1,000 nanometers or one micrometer. And we see that our peak is way over here. And it actually isn't way over here. This is a logarithmic scale. It's way over here. And much more is absorbed in the atmosphere. This is the, the Earth radiating as a black body. This is what gets out because you've got all these strong bands of water, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on, it's acting as a blanket to insulate the Earth. So if we look at the carbon cycle, we have about, we have about seven, whatever that is, kilograms of anthropogenic carbon de developed a year, most of it from carbon fuels, some from agricultural. 
there's about a hundred times that in the atmosphere. Um, so it's not a lot of additional each year, but it is additional each year. Terrestrial vegetation, except maybe for trees, is in neutral. Ocean sequestration, there is some that goes in, there's some that comes out. But the deep ocean storage is huge compared to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's a lot goes in, a lot comes out, and all I have to do is tip that a little bit, and we may be able to save ourselves. What happens is it goes in as sediments, refractory, dissolved organic material, calcium carbonate, and some other materials. We're getting deep water sedimentation is about a tenth, not, not a lot. But the net gain, and so the net gain to the atmosphere is about four, whatever that is, gigatons, or six tenths of a percent increase a year. A little bit goes into some shallow ocean take up, a little bit goes into ocean acidification, which is not a good thing. So the largest, one of the largest places where carbon is sequestered is in coal. And huge amounts of carbon were sequestered about 200, 300 million years ago, because trees figured out how to make lignin, wood, but it took bacteria 64 million years to figure out how to break it down. So all of this wood got buried and became coal. And it's, lignin is hard to break down even today, and it's a phenol, it's a polymer of phenol, not sugar, like most biopolymers. So when they break it down, it becomes a toxic material anyway. So at that time, the Earth's atmosphere is 30% plus oxygen. You had dragonflies this wide. But there is a potential lesson to the idea of sequestering carbon in a hard-to-break-down polymer. Now, world coal consumption is much is very large. You say, how can human beings do this effect that we're so small? There, we burn enough carbon every year to cover Central Park almost a mile deep. That's a lot of carbon. Um, here, uh, I, I was in underway in uh, Duluth Superior a little while ago. We passed the stern of the Palartra Grutha, which is the largest bulk on the Great Lakes, and it was taking 63,000 long tons of coal down to a power plant in Indiana, which would burn it in 18 hours. 63,000 tons, one power plant. Um, there, there are some numbers for what coal is worth BTU-wise. It doesn't have a lot of BTUs per kilogram of, co of carbon dioxide, and it doesn't produce a whole lot of, it produces about a kilowatt for a little more than a kilogram of carbon dioxide. Oil. Oil is produced from a, by a similar process, but from marine sediments of various microscopic critters, um, especially creatures that store li lipids. It's not dead dinosaurs. Basically, a sea is closed off, becomes anoxic, all the sediments buried, heat and pressure make petroleum. Uh, conventional oil then flows through the source rock into some sort of geological trap. In the world consumption is also roughly a cubic mile of oil every year. If you want to be cool in Houston, uh, you describe a reservoir by the era, the rock type, and the trap type. So something is a Permian, sandstone, salt dome. That's West Texas. Um, limestone. Um, Jurassic limestone anticline, that's Saudi Arabia. Okay, but there's less carbon per BTU. Natural gas occurs from both coal and oil. If you heat either coal or oil too much, you get natural gas. Also, the other fractions of, of the material that makes coal come off as methane. That's why mines explode. Uh, the world consumes a lot of it, but it's a lot of kilowatts of electricity, for example, per kilogram of carbon dioxide, mainly because we're using uh, uh, gas-fired power plants or gas turbines with, team, with steam bottoming, very efficient plants. Now, what we need to do is we need to decarbonize, and that's minimizing of fossil fuels, particularly for coal, and that's happening because natural gas is a better solution. We need to improve energy efficiency, and this is where a lot of people in this industry can do this because the broad knowledge of people in this industry will, sometimes you'll come up with something to improve efficiency that someone else might not have thought of. Um, metallurgical coal and concrete are also a big source of carbon dioxide. Agricultural pra practices we can improve. 
everyone talks about re renewable energy, and there's a lot of different kinds. Um, and there's a lot of progress being made in it. California's already reached its 2020 goals for renewable energy. The problem with renewable energy is how to transport and store the energy. Transport in the case of sea, ocean energy, storage in the case of photo and wind. There's a lot of approaches to that. Again, people who are in this industry and marine engineers couldn't th think about this. We are getting a lot of progress in, exact, in, in advanced nuclear fission. Um, my favorite thought, my favorite is thorium cycle, which uh, there's, they've run thorium cycle reactors a long time ago. Indian, India has a thorium cycle program. And one of the things I thought about when I was young was to going into thor, uh, magnetohydrodynamics. I wasn't smart enough, so I had to drop the magneto part. But that was about fusion. And they, people have been promising fusion for, oh, we'll have thir grid connection fusion in 30 years. They've been doing that for about, saying that for about 50 years. But we're finally getting to that point. Well, the uh, National Ignition Faci Facility in Livermore has reached uh, ignition temperatures. There's a wide range of advanced Tuckamuck um, torus connectors. And there's some very interesting exotic systems for fusion. So decarbonization is possible. We have to survive in the meantime. Takala and Sokolo come up with a concept of stabilization wedges. And basically, it takes eight wedges of a trillion, uh, a billion tons of carbon per year to stabilize emissions. So we're only making, emitting the same amount of carbon that we are today. That doesn't reduce the amount. That just keeps us from going up. And then to go down, we need another seven wedges. But this wedges is a, um, it's a, it's a billion tons of carbon. One of the things you have to remember is there's carbon, there's carbon dioxide. Some things are in one and one, some are the other. Um, a kilogram of carbon produces 3.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So this is the Hail Mary option. It isn't necessarily the best idea, but we might not be able to get the other things together. And the point is, is that the latest projection says we need negative emissions to reach a maximum of 2 degrees C. So physical options, deep ocean or liquid, um, deep ocean liquid CO2 or clathrate hydrate injection. Basalt injection, problem with any kind of injection of CO2 is how to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, but they are making progress in that. One of the ways of doing it is take the emissions from a power plant. At least it's significantly more carbon dioxide. That road needs air, pipelines, energy, and it's expensive. They say $15 a ton easy. But we'll talk about IRS Chapter Q24 a little bit later. We might want to power our carbon separation and injection by ocean, ocean renewable energy. Another possibility is to make fuel from ocean renewable energy. The reason is, is that carbon dioxide is more concentrated in seawater and it might be easier to take off. But the problem is, making fuel is still only carbon neutral. We're taking, still taking carbon, we're still burning, we're still putting it into the atmosphere. So we might want to use energy intensive chemicals instead. Deep ocean injection, very simple, at least in, in, in theory, the thermodynamics. Once carbon dioxide gets cold enough and under enough pressure, it's denser than seawater and sinks. And that happens at about uh, 9,000 feet down. So we can separate carbon dioxide, pump it 9,000 feet down, and we'll end up with a puddle of carbon dioxide in the bottom of the ocean, sort of like you know, a puddle of water in the bottom of a fuel tank. Um, oh, man. Will that leak? Most likely. Will that affect the environment in the deep ocean? Most likely. Maybe not a great idea. The other option is to mix it with, with ice with cold water, and that produces these ice crystals that contain the molecules within them. It's called either clathrate or hydrate. Both terms are, are, are <coughs> requires a much lower pressure requirement. It's been tested at sea, and it may also leak, but it's a little easier to do. The really great one, the one that is probably the best solution for physical um, uh, Sequestration is to inject it into a basalt, inject carbon dioxide into a basalt formula uh, formation. This becomes carbonate materials um, and heat. It's actually an energetic 
reaction. It's good to put it in, in ocean because the higher pressure helps the reaction go along and contains the carbon dioxide. So, and it won't leak. This material is locked in mineral form. You inject the gas, and sometime later, that's what it looks like. It's a, it's a crystal. It'll be down there for millions of years. And it's been tested. Um, there's a little controversy with the science, but it's been tested. They injected 250 tons of carbon dioxide in, in a formation in Iceland. 95% became calcite and was gone forever, basically. So, maybe we can just bury all the carbon dioxide. And there's a pr proposed project off the coast of New Jersey that's about 70 miles offshore and in 600 feet of water. And 70 miles, 600 feet deep is nothing by the standards of offshore oil these days, except for the 70 mile pipeline from the power plant. And as I said, the palisades themselves, if you wonder what basalt looks like, it's the palisades. That's, a base, that's the upwards extension of the basalt formula, of basalt formation. There are also sites off Washington, Oregon, with 100 years of capacity. It's expensive though, probably. Uh, requires energy. Something to think about. Another possibility is fuel production at sea. Again, we use ocean energy. We separate water or carbon dioxide from water, hi electrolyze hydrogen, mix the two together, hopefully, and some kind of hydrocarbon we can use for something else comes out. Another thing they use, uh, use it for is making ammonia, um, which isn't does has no global warming potential. I mean, it doesn't produce global warming. And interestingly enough, um, Kings Point is running experiments now, running big diesel engines on ammonia. It works. Anyway, the point is to use the standard stranded energy. Carbon dioxide is more concentrated in, in seawater. But you know, as if with anything, the devil's in the details. And it's still only carbon neutral. The other interesting one, the one that it is more controversial, but if it works, if it, we're, we're in great shape, is biological sequestration. The ocean's the major sink for carbon dioxide. The conduit is biological uptake. Uh, what happens is all of the critters that live on the sea die, sink, become sediments. But there's something called the red field ratio we'll talk about that may limit the tank to take up. The thing is the o tropical ocean and fertility is very small. And as a result, where we have the most solar energy in the tropics, we have the least life. So that's because the nutrients are trapped below the warm water in the tropics. But there's some, so the approaches were, that people have been looking at are either iron fertilization, what I call a gerotol option after commercials that some of us are old enough to have seen, artificial upwelling, kelp farming, and littoral aeration. The biological pump is simple. Plants on the surface grow, make tissue, something else eats them. In the, at the end, everybody sinks. And um, at, at, in the process, various creatures make various kinds of tissues out of the carbohydrates that the plants produce. Some of them are chitin, another sugar polymer, some is fats, lipids. Who's, who's had lipid, a lipid panel that your doctor's giving you a hard time about? I have. Um, that's fat. Um, some of them is car calcium carbonate shells. Some is, is silica shells that go to that have some organic material with them. But the problem is, again, this red fuel ratio. It, uh, chitin, for example, is almost exactly as the same amount of nitrogen and carbon as, as ocean waters. So that nitrogen we need goes down. Okay, so... Anyway, the problem is we need the nutrients of the surface, and that's the controversy. Here we have a uh, couple of graphs of, or graphics of the, ocean, of the ocean biological pump from a presentation by uh, David Carl, who's been working on this for years out of Hawaii. And uh, his, this whole PowerPoint of his is in the references. I, if you're interested, it's the best one to read to get a quick overview of the whole business. Um, basically, stuff goes up, stuff, stuff comes back, stuff goes down, stuff comes back up as up, up, upwelling. This is some more details of the particular craters. One interesting thing is the aggregation of some phytoplankton is where oil comes from. These aggregates 
are the ones that sink. Um, a particular um, phytoplankton, Botrychoccus browni, is, seen, is probably responsible for much of our fossil oil. And it's available today. You can buy it from UC Berkeley. Uh, anyway, um, so I've talked about the Redfield ratio. Most ocean water, most biological tissue is at this Redfield ratio. And this is maybe the limit to biological sequestration. And it's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus, the three chemicals that are vital to life besides hydrogen and oxygen. And there have been various numbers of it, some controversy about exactly the ratio of phosphorus to everything else, a little bit about ratios of nitrogen. But um, what it is, is you need these two nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, to, produce, to sequester that much carbon. That's the theory, at least. There's a couple of other extended redfield ratios where someone says, oh, yeah, you need iron, too. In the case of some other creatures, you need silicon, too. But, and so if you talk to an oceanographer about ocean sequestration, say, no, it won't work, redfield ratio. The reason is that it assumes it will just go up and down and nothing will happen. But maybe a general average rather than a requirement. There, we've been finding more and more material that is not at redfield ratio. Um, phytoplankton especially, which is what we want to grow, frequently deviates wildly from redfield ratio. So, but the bottom line, biological fixing, you need the nutrients. You've got to be your lawn to get it to go green. Um, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, those are the first two of the three numbers when you buy lawn food. You know, you have lawn foods in three numbers. One's nitrogen, one's phosphorus, the third is calcium. Um, but, thank goodness, along the shore, we've been pouring huge amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus into the ocean. Maybe this pollution problem might be a solution. It would be ironic. <laughs> So here we have a graph of chlorophyll levels in the, in the Pacific. You can see in the tropics, you are way down here, whereas up in the northern area where you've got overturning, you're two, three magnitudes larger of biological activity, and hence carbon take up. So the Geritol option. The idea is, oh, it's the Redfield ratio that Includes iron is the problem. We don't have enough iron. They observed dust storms from North Africa uh, affecting producing blooms in the Indian Ocean and said, oh, it must be iron. So they said, okay, let's pour iron into the ocean. Very little bit, don't need much. And you get a bloom and everything will be great. And uh, the problem, one of the problems with this was, and non-political one, which I mean non-scientific one, which is probably a lesson for us, is that the people who came up with this say, oh boy, we can make a lot of money selling invest shares in our in our system, and as a result, the environmentalists went ape. You know, making money by fixing the environment, a bad dog. And large-scale experiments in this were banned. There's also some issues having to do with the particular creatures and the particular water chemistry. Well, this is the science. We do know that in the right water, high nitrogen, low chlorophyll regions, we get a bloom, we get a significant bloom, but the question is how much of it goes down as sequestered carbon? What is the ratio of iron? What else is gonna happen that's bad? And how does it scale? So another lesson from nature is tropical upwelling. If we look here <coughs> off the coast, South America, particularly Peru, we see the Humboldt Current, and there we have biological activity well, as much as two orders of magnitude greater than in the rest of the Pacific. And maybe that will sequester some carbon. However, some of these upwellings are net sources of carbon dioxide, not sinks. Uh, because deep sea water already has substantial carbon dioxide. <laughs> Again, wet field ratio. But Super, the, the, we may see what they call super red field ratio, in other words, phytoplankton that don't obey the red field ratio. So artificial upwelling is a controversial solution. One study that says it doesn't work says, oh, at the most it'll produce one wedge of carbon sequestration. One wedge is one eighth of what we need. So it might be worth doing. 
Location, species, what one did realtor say? Location, location, location. Well, it's location, <laughs> location, location, species, species, and chemistry. So uh, not everywhere. It doesn't work everywhere. It may work in some places. There's a lot of questions. I'll let you look at the questions on the handout rather than going through them. But they're the obvious ones. I mean, what environmental disaster are we going to produce for this? Okay, most of the ideas have been wave powered upwellings, and this has been one of the problems. Um, marine um, biologists are not real good at designing wave energy devices, and all of their devices have been relatively poor and broken. They die pretty quick, limited amounts of water. So those of us who understand the forces of waves on objects can design reasonably good wave energy devices pretty easily. We, those of us who understand pumps can design reasonably good pumps pretty easily. So we can solve the problem of upwelling if the problem is getting enough water. Um, this produces some interesting ideas, one of which is that if you've got um, a lot of cold water coming up from the surface, um, server farms need cooling, they need electricity. And especially Bitcoin mining doesn't need to export anything except a little bit of data every once in a while. And even if we are having server farms that need a lot of data interchange, we have this guy, Elon Musk, who likes to shoot sports cars into space. And he might be able to convince to be convinced to get some more data satellites in the air. I've talked about OTEC. This is ocean thermal energy conversion. Basically, it's a steam engine of some kind running between cold water and hot water. The hot water surface on the surface is a boiler. The cold water is a condenser. Um, usually they use ammonia uh, as the medium rather than water. And you get uh, a maximum theoretical thermal efficiency of about 9%. Not much, but it is free. But what that means is that all of your components in that plant have to be as perfect as you can possibly get them. Um, so there's some ongoing, a lot of ongoing research in this project. The other problem is a 3,000 foot cold water pipe, a 3,000 foot pipe, three meters, um, 10 meters in diameter. Not a trivial engineering uh, exercise. How do you even launch such a thing? But there's been ongoing researches and trials. We've, um, um, you know, the one megawatt plant worked. There's a plant off Hawaii that works. There's some other plants going in. And there's an outfit in Baltimore that's looking at propylene because ammonia doesn't like copper, and copper is the only thing that doesn't biofoul. So they said, okay, instead of figuring out all these complicated biofouling mechanisms, we'll just use a different, different working fluid. Now, if upwelling alone works, depending on the place, the point is you have huge amounts of cold water from the plant. Now, the best case gives you a maybe 10,000 tons of sequestration per megawatt per year. That's the best case. So an aggressive OTEC plant might give us a whole wedge. Now, someone told me he could build an OTEC plant for a million dollars a megawatt. I'll, I'll, buy, I'll bid $5 million a megawatt. But that still gives us some significant money in carbon credits as well as whatever we get from the, for the energy. We also might be able to make ammonia. And of course, the bloom is naturally, whether the bloom sequesters carbon dioxide or not, it's going to produce a fish bloom. And ammonia fertilizers, for cheap ammonia fertilizers for the third world plus fish. And anyone ever said, well, we're not trying to solve world hunger? Yeah, well, we're going to solve world hunger in this. We could, sort of. Anyway, but, the, but there's questions. Does it work at all? And is there a uh, trade-off between sequestration and economics? So other OTEC options, well, we could use the energy for either both ocean or basalt injection, although that means we'd have to be have to have an OTEC plant like 10,000 feet of water. Not a hard job anymore. Anyone seen uh, that movie? Uh, what was the movie with uh, uh, Mark Wahlberg getting blown up in a oil rig recently? I just saw that. Deepwater Horizon, they were in 10,000 feet of water, something ridiculous. Um, what we do is bring the water up, dissolve the gases come off when we take the pressure and warm it up, and we do something with them with the using the OTEC energy. Um, we need some progress in 
producing hydrogen and ammonia, or whatever it is we want. And uh, of course, this results in lost revenue if we're using the energy for something else. Do we need to add phosphorus or iron? I don't know. This, those suggest the idea of a hybrid OTEC plant. Um, and this is a sketch of one. Within the, um, of the schematic, within the red boundary is a conventional OTEC plant. Cold water pipe, heat exchanger turbine, uh, warm water heat exchanger to condense it, pump around the cycle. But what we do is we add to that, we suck up, we take carbon dioxide coming out in the, uh, in the cold water exchanger because we've warmed it up. We uh, mix it with some of the hot water, which warms it up still further. Carbon dioxide comes out. We use some recent developments in catalyst plus energy to make the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. We make hydrogen. We combine that with a carbon monoxide. We get methane, ethylene, whatever, and we sell that. The wa mixed water has been depleted of carbon so in order to maintain the red field ratio, it has to take up carbon biologically. Maybe it's maybe this would work. It might be a way around this red field ratio issue. The littoral aeration is something completely different. The idea is very simple. Littoral waters like the Chesapeake Bay have been damaged greatly by pollution. And there's many anoxic areas that are, were never there historically. So if we can restore those areas, by a combination of doing the right thing with pollution and by artificial aerating, we can restore biological activity to those areas, which hopefully sequesters carbon. And as an example of this, just the oyster shells from people eating them in 1900 probably sequestered 80,000 tons of carbon in the form of people's driveways. That's what you use it for in Maryland. Florida too. You know. Anyway, so all of the critters that didn't get pulled up to the surface and eaten must have sequestered a lot more carbon. Now we have plenty of nutrients thanks to pollution, but aerated zones cannot reduce nitrogen pollution. You need an anoxic environment to reduce nitrogen, so that might be a problem. But these dead anoxic zones produce methane. Methane is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas. And so we might not be sequestering carbon, but we might be suppressing methane. It's again, something that needs to be more carefully looked at. Kelp, so-called macroalgae, is basically a perennial, well, they have annual and perennial species, but most of of interest are perennial. They have an old fast down here, which is essentially, uh, has no, it is immortal. And it grows fronds all the time. It's like, I've got hostas in my front yard. If anyone has hostas, you know how they come up every year. Kind of creepy, you know, green fingers. Anyway, um, they need upwellings. They need a substrate. The fronds grow from a hold fast. And um, the fronds grow at a phenomenal rate, which is a phenomenal level of gathering carbon, which then is transported by fish and critters and all these other things, and eventually goes down to the deep sea. And kelp farming is a substantial carbon sink. And some studies, the Koreans are very interested in this. Some studies suggest that artificial kelp farming could cover all 15 wedges of carbon necessary. Probably not, but it could certainly cover more than one. And artificial kelp farming, we've been doing that for years. In Ireland, in uh, France, um, they actually, you know, seed it, gather it up. This is a, a kelp harvesting ship in New Zealand. Big ship, probably an interesting design contract. Um, this has been a subject of test for years. There's something called the Ocean Food and Energy Project in the 70s. Um, first heard about that at spring meeting in, in Samey in 1976 or so. Um, and it's going on. There was a capstone project at the Naval Academy last April on kelp farming. It may also help gather the nitrogen and phosphorus pollution that we're getting from shore sources. I was, I came up on the train and, this, and the guy next to me happened to be a bioengineer and we thought about the idea of bioengineering kelp to do a better job. And we both were horrified by the idea, but it's always a possibility. 
We may need upper artificial upwelling. Um, we don't know exactly how much is sequestered, which we do have to know to do economics. And, but it will require artificial structures in deep water. Those of you who are looking for interesting study projects, the cable dynamics of palm fronds in waves and, their, and the cable dynamics of what they're connected to has got to be a very interesting hydrodynamic study. Uh, cable dynamics are a big deal in the offshore oil industry. And um, this is kind of a funny cable, basically. A uh, loss of palm fronds to storms is a major um, problem with kelp. Um, again, though, it's been mostly suggested to go kelp to fuel, which is carbon neutral. We can restore natural kelp farm, and this is the main reason we, uh, I'm, I'm giving this paper, because it's, I wanted to say it's something we ought to think about. Come on, get, you know, that, that's, that's funny. I don't care where you are. Um, but what happens is, is our, our, our cute megafauna, um, our cute charismatic megafauna eat urchin, sea urchins, which eat the whole fast. So when they eat the whole fast, the kelp dies. So the sea urchin keeps them in, I mean, the sea otter keeps them under control. But we lost almost all the sea otters to fur hunting in, in the 1800s. They figured that the current otter population shelters enough kelp, kelp to take four to eight megatons of carbon. And it's about 1% of the actual population. So sea otters could account for as much as a tenth of a wedge, maybe more. And it's very low cost compared to credits. And again, it, you know, it's cute. People don't donate to it. You can uh, put money in to see, for sea auto restoration on your California income tax form. Um, but the, pro the other problem is, is, hey, I did last year. Um, it, there's uh, impacts of pollution on, on otters. They're appearing with cat diseases from discarded kitty litter into, into sewage and so on. This is something that needs to be worked on. And when they've tried to recolonize, send otters out to new places that they were formerly in, the otters have hightailed at home. So how do we get otters to go into new neighborhoods? And uh, there's some thought, interesting thought about that. Otters uh, like shallow water, because probably because it protects them from their predators. A shark can't get them, an orca can't get them, and they can hang out. And here in Baltimore, well, here down in Baltimore, the National Aquarium has been building artificial floating wetlands to restore, um, to take care of pollution in the harbor. And perhaps an artificial otter condo would be just the thing that would convince an otter to raise his family. Um, and this is naval architecture stuff. Ocean, um, aquarium folk can probably design one that will work in Baltimore Harbor, but one that works at sea in waves and wind and gets needs to be anchored and all that stuff is another question. This even gives you another interesting idea, and that is farm kelp. Um, and then go through the process of bringing up epwelling, taking carbon dioxide, making energy intensive chemicals, and then make it into plastic. The big problem we have today is there's all this plastic in the environment and it's not going anywhere. Well, as with coal, a substance that goes into the environment and doesn't go anywhere is probably what we need. Now, it would be nice if instead of letting it go into trees and the water, we could gather it up. But, you know, we can gather it up. And in India, they use thermoplastics, polyethylene, that sort of thing, instead of asphalt to make roads. It's the binder. They heat it up just like asphalt, mix it with sand and so on, and make a road out of it. Um, so, and it stays inert in the environment for millennia. The ironic thing about this is someday, hundreds of millions of years from now, maybe some intelligent creature will be in a meeting and say, we don't know where all of this petrochemical comes from. It seems to have originated in some sort of polymer. So all the plastic we're putting into the environment today is someday going to become oil. Probably. We need to look at, at economics. There's been a lot of schemes. Uh, in 2008, Carbon credits were worth about eight euros a ton. In 2018, the latest thing I saw in the California markets was 15 to 22 dollars a ton for carbon credits, sequestration, avoidance, etc. However, Section 45Q of the new IRS code 
despite the current administration's statements about climate change, gives $50 a ton to carbon capture and sequestration schemes. Previously, it was $20 a ton, and they limited the amount of credit what was possible. They've lifted the credit and increased the amount to $50 a ton. This is starting to be real money. And the economist, um, Joseph Stiglitz, whose name I've misspelled, said we needed about $40 a ton to actually get enough initiative to decarbonize energy. So we're there. We're there. Canada's going to go $50 Canadian a ton, which is about 40 U.S., I guess. So one wedge is worth anywhere from 45 to $120 billion. In the case of otters, that's an awful lot of otter treats. Um, so there's many sequestration streams that are probably expensive, but might be economically viable now. We have to think about all the business models possible and figure out ways of separating investors from their money um, and making and making and saving the earth. Again, there's an awful lot of moving parts here. Um, biology and chemistry at sea. Um, those of us who are naval architects, if you're interested in this, you've got, a, got some homework. Um, chemical engineers are working on catalysts and similar processes to do the capture, do the transformations and so on. There's a lot of progress in this. Subscribe to Science Daily through Google. You'll get a, 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 the subject of catalysts is always up there. Uh, so we need to be able to work with scientists and oceanographers. Let's come up with some crazy ideas, some new and, and innovative ideas. I mean, Rick, come on. Let's get some ideas out of you. you you're good for them, I know. Yep, yep. That's right. And you know, if you think, if you keep thinking about this, you'll come up with some interesting things. I don't know how to get these out into the street, but it's our duty to figure out the ideas, at least throw them out there, which is what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I've done my job. There's a lot of engineering details, and we need to understand the environmental impacts. A friend of mine used to say the worst thing an engineer can say is, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And we have to make sure we're not going to be saying that in 40 or 50 years. Well, I'm not going to be saying it in 40 or 50 years, but you might. So, opportunities for the marine industry. Uh, deep injection schemes, especially basalt, is just oil drilling backwards. We're putting it in instead of taking it out. We need to figure out where the energy comes from. But ocean energy, waves and current might work on that. Um, I have Peter Noble, I think, was working on a project where they were going to use uh, a wave energy generator on the Brent platform in the North Sea to, for um, um, second tier um, water flood injection. I don't know how that went out or anything, but the idea of hanging a um, wave harvester onto a platform and using the energy is, is, is not original. Of course, once we've got drilling rigs and all this other stuff, we're going to have all the boats go with it. Uh, we're going to have big pipelines and big pipe lay vessels. That's a lot of business. The biological schemes will have all kinds of different kind of units, whether they're small wave energy pumps or, you know, consider an OTIC carrier. It's going to basically be an oil tanker combined with a drill rig. It's a monster. So, you know, there are a lot of possible uh, ocean engineering, naval architecture, marine engineering, um, opportunities here. Now, one of the things about naval architects and marine engineers was brought to me when I was young, uh, when I was in junior high school. My father took me to a talk by Buckminster Fuller. And Buckminster Fuller went on for quite a while about how shipbuilders, naval architects, seamen, were the true pioneers and great innovators in history, which I thought was good. My father, he was a case from Kings Point, so he thought it was great. Um, but that's true. You know, the demands of the sea have always pushed technology. And Peter Noble had a, had a discussion, in, uh, a paper in, uh, or a presentation in Texas section just at the beginning of the year that basically made many of the same points. This is something he said for many years. And as I say, I, I'm sure a lot of you 
um, have thought this. I mean, we have a very we have to have a very broad base of knowledge to design a ship. We have to know heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We have to know electricity. We have to know the uh, chemistry of combustion and diesel engines. We have to know hydrodynamics and ship motions. We have to know, you know, in the course of doing any commercial work, you end up finding out interesting things about, about cargo. If you're in the oil industry, you end up learning about all of this geo geochemistry. So naval architects and marine engineers frequently have very broad knowledge, maybe an inch deep, but a mile wide. And that is what is required to come up and synthesize solutions. Inventions come out of synthesis, taking this from here and this from there and bringing them together. <laughs> you know, putting a racer on the end of the pencil. Okay. And it also comes from thinking always about interactions. And anyone who's designed a ship knows that is everything, how parts interact together. Um, I remember, Rick, you responding to something on LinkedIn about that, that how, how a naval architect had to be uh, consider all of these trade-offs. And this is true. I mean, you guys have a unique education compared to a lot of engineers, those of you who are students, because you're seeing so broad uh, a field. And so, basically, that puts all of us in a unique position to tackle some of these problems in the environment. And it's our duty and our opportunity to do so. So, to summarize, don't start thinking about tomorrow. I guess that was Clinton's theme song. But marine carbon sequ sequestration may be a substantial contribution to preventing catastrophic climate change. It's not the only thing. Alternative energy, efficiency, and so on are also important. Think about those too. Ocean, alternative ocean energy, short commercial. Um, efficiency in systems. There's a lot of ways to pick up power and, and, and uh, make things more efficient. One of the things I worked on in Coast Guard was very simple. Putting heat exchangers above the hood in a galley. Picks up hot heat, you, hop, you, you make hot water with it. Um, saves electricity in your hot water heater, which is nice on a ship because electricity is very expensive on a ship. But all of this depends on carbon credit, economics, tax, and policy. It depends on better science and engineering details, including us finding out more about the science, which is why I've got this massive pile of references. So I'm just asking you to keep on thinking, keep alert for new ideas. And so thank you for listening. And rather than questions, come on, give me some ideas. Anyway, so. Any questions or ideas? That's what that's what it seems like. Remember, it, it, it is, it is. And I may have messed the numbers up. I'm not saying that I didn't. But um, remember, there's a difference between some, some things are carbon dioxide and some are carbon. So you've got a 3.6, the 44 twelfths factor in there. So it could be more. And it probably will be by the time we really get into this. You know, there, there's talk about $100 a, a ton. That's right. That's right. That's right. I live on public money. I spend money. Yeah. I'm not a gnome. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know? Yes. Uh, with the carbon injection methods, has there been any research done into the possibility of it's not going to be as much as uh, you're going to get from two degrees of, of, of temperature rise. I mean, the ocean is an average of 10,000 feet deep, and a couple of degrees produce one part in a thousand of increased volume. So, you know, one part in a thousand of 10,000 feet is 10 feet. So that puts us. About today, or I think, you know, it's going to come up. So, yeah, I mean, it, it will be some, but it won't be as much as um, we would get from uncontrolled carbon, sequ uh, uncontrolled carbon in the air. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I wonder if anyone has uh, tried to put together a system to actually. 
actually make this happen and find out what the cost and what the uh, physical problems are to actually accomplish it. Well, that's exactly it. Um, I have a DVD that someone from a firm called App Motion, which is trying to commercialize up artificial upwelling, sent me. And that was a Discovery Channel um, special uh, where David Carl and Ricardo Letelier, of, who is the, at the University of Washington, I guess, no, University of Oregon, one or the other, I, don't, I never remember which is ducks and which is beavers, but at one of the Oregon universities did. And they actually tried a wave power pump. They measured a bloom and so on. The wave power pump tore itself to pieces in a couple of days. But they did get a bloom, and they didn't have enough instrumentation to be able to figure out if they were doing it. But people are doing these experiments now. They're doing them badly because they don't know what they're doing about a marine engineer, which is, again, where we need to, we, they need our help. Anyone else? I didn't see any. Oh, come on. We got to. How close are we to 50 minutes? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, it is a huge pipe. Green. It's a big <laughs> pipe. I mean, it's, it's a thousand meters long and at least 10 meters across. And the problem, there are a couple of problems of it. One of them is if you take this enormous straw and you wiggle it. Now, the other thing is we've, we found out a long time ago that OTEC pipes have to be neutrally buoyant. So that means they've got to be plastic, they've got to be steel with flotation, or they've got to be fiberglass. And what Lockheed is doing now is they have a system where they're casting the pipe as it goes. As they're casting the pipe and lowering it, casting and lowering it, casting and lowering it. Whether this will work or not is a second question. And I remember back in the day, couldn't figure out how to launch a 3,000-foot-long pipe or how to upend it. But I have now, you know, a few years later, I was launching 1,000-foot platforms in, in the North Sea and upending them. So there probably are ways of doing it. It probably will require things like auxiliary boards, buoyancy, or something like that. I have no idea. But I think it's a solvable problem. <laughs> so... We are going to have OTEC, but the key to OTEC is another one. If OTEC is a net carbon source, we don't want to do it. So we've got to answer that science. We don't want to make things worse than they already are. If it's positive, if it's carbon negative, in other words, a, a sequestering device, it's great. If it's carbon neutral, well, it's a carbon neutral source of energy, great. If it's carbon positive, which is what they had thought about one time, then why bother? We have plenty of carbon positive energy that, 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 that are cheaper and easier. You know. Yes. What? Yeah, I don't know. Come on, Rick. Well, I think you. Oh, yes, yes. The male otters, you hear me, are. Male otters would not make it through the. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, so, they are weasels after all. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I Rick can tell you about <laughs> particularly awful. Yeah, you know, all the checks you made, you see it right in the answer. You see it like the flag would go on the blue cruise. I mean, it's land based fossils and they're nitrogen bones. And, um, Well, that's the thing. If, if we look at the amount, if we take a red field ratio and say, okay, um, we are getting 20 weights of carbon per weight of nitrogen and 100 and change weights of carbon per weight of phosphorus, and we estimate how much nitrogen and phosphorus are tossing into the ocean with the phenomenal amounts, then we're going to get uh, roughly you know, 100 times as much sequestration as we do phosphorus, as we do moles of phosphorus. Now, phosphorus is heavier, chromatic, so it's about 30, 
it's actually 30 times as much weight. So I, I forget what the atomic number of phosphorus or the uh, mass unit number of phosphorus is. But one mole of phosphorus sequesters over 100 moles of carbon. One mole of nitrogen, of bioavailable nitrogen, not nitrogen gas, of course, but either urea, ammonia, or nitrate sequesters 20. What is one? 116 divided by 14, or whatever that number is, moles of carbon. So, yeah, um, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, we should be able to sequester 20 times that, that amount of carbon. A big number, because we're really pouring a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen into the air. That's right, it's politically attractive because it's expensive to prevent pouring nitrogen and especially phosphorus into the environment. If we can figure out some way to say, oh, don't worry about it, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. We might be able to take some of that money that's being spent to try to get phosphorus out of the ocean and, and um, use it to naturally sequester phosphorus. Because sequestering carbon will sequester also phosphorus. Yes. Yes, there is. That's correct. There is, is some concern about that. And, you know, all of these things, like I say, it seemed like a good idea at the time. All these things need to be explored and verified before we go ahead with them in, in, in any great extent. We probably can't pump enough ocean water up to make a big change, but we do need, you know, we've been surprised by things that seem like benign in the environment before. So that's one of the most important things. We've got to make sure that we don't make stuff worse or come up with some other horrific problem. Like if we pump up water from the deep oceans, what critters are we bringing up from there that could harm the ecology of the upper surface of the ocean? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Some of the studies of natural carbon sequestration in the nor have suggested it works very well in the northern area because of the mix of species. There's a critter called a copepod that is a microscopic but multicellular animal that um, sequesters a great deal of lipids as part of it, as, and chitin, as part of its, um, part of its body. And it... Um, it's a significant carbon sequestration mechanism. Um, there's a reference in the list. And again, I, all the references I think I put on there, except for the science fiction novel, are available online, you know, open source. So, um, including one monster textbook on marine biology, which you can read in your spare time. So, get, if you're interested in this, get the reference list. I should have put the web access web addresses and I couldn't get around to it, sorry, but you can find it on Google. So, Alan, are, are, we, are, we, are we there yet or do we need more questions? Does anyone have any more questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this here. This is one in New Zealand. Uh, they um, have kelp farms in New Zealand. Kelp uh, makes um, uh, chemicals that they use in um, cosmetics and making ice cream in those little gummy things that you put on, artif on frozen yogurt and some other stuff. And so, they, yeah, it's basically a big um, kelp cutter. It's basically a big uh, lawnmower, essentially, with conveyor belts behind it that stuff up and this is one is in New Zealand. Uh, there's some French ones that use a system they call Scooby-Doo which is named after the thing that makes they use at camp to make those um, little Brady things. Uh, it's kind of a little thing that goes in the water and twists sort of like eating pasta. And, uh, yeah so and then I don't know what the Irish do but uh, yeah this is a, uh, a Kiwi kelp harvester ship and you can see that's a pretty good ship it looks like a couple hundred feet long to me. 
and uh, not a trivial piece of marine engineering, especially this ramp and uh, ramp dredge in the front. So, yeah, and the reference is there, and it's a uh, again a New Zealand it's a New Zealand ship. Anyone else? Yes. I don't want. Yeah, that's permanent. Absolutely. Yeah, it's carbon neutral. So what we really need to do is figure out something else to do with these hydrocarbons, if we can. Yeah. My thought is we use about 3 million tons of plastic a year. It's mostly carbon by weight. So that's a third of a wedge. And uh, so if we can capture well, what we do with kelp is we let it rot and become methane. Take the methane, make it into ethylene, make that into plastic. And so if we can make all of our plastic out of biological sources, and then not incinerate it at least, hopefully do something nice with it, but at least throw it, throw it on, on the street and let it get cotton trees, um, uh, we can sequester a third of a wedge. So and it, maybe we can compress it into bricks with sand and dump it into the ocean and have Little lake goes all the way, all, all scattered along the ocean floor. All you're doing is collecting air for a couple of years, and then it comes right back out. That's right. I, I have my compost in the backyard. Yeah, me too. I've got one. I, I, I've got one. I've got one myself. Now, doing exactly that. But, um, but yeah, the, one of the things to do is make more use of wood. And one of the things that's been most interesting about that, for those of us who are structural engineers, is that um, there's some very advanced uh, wood engineering, particularly in New Zealand and California, where they're making 20-story buildings out of wood. And um, those will be around for at least a 50, 60, 70 years. We only need to get past the current situation where fossil fuels are our dominant form of energy. Once we can get over the rainbow to fusion and fission and some alternative energy, we might be able to make it. So the idea is um, temporary is not as temporary is not great, but it's not as bad as Letting it go. Admittedly, basalt injection is probably the safest method, but it's energy expensive. On the other hand, it's also naval architecture is expensive, so probably a good idea. Yeah. Exactly. Well. That's exactly uh, exactly the point because uh, my wife has dictated a a, um, a home improvement project that involves buying buying a bunch of trek decking, which is plastic, wood fiber, and glass. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone cares about sequestering glass because that's sand, but I'm sequestering wood by encapsulating in plastic. Unfortunately, the plastic came out of a um, uh, oil. Well, that's right. And, and my uh, my neighborhood association did that recently. We buried a bunch of Christmas trees <laughs> along. Well, we've got uh, a beach 
a community beach that gets eroded, so we bury Christmas trees in the beach to kind of try to help them. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you know, we have to, uh, you know, there are solutions that aren't solutions, or non-working solutions, as some people say. And so we have, always we have to be careful, to make sure that all the science is right. And in this area too, uh, all the science has to be has to be there. Um, and so what that means is that we have to have a, anyone who's interested in this has to have at least a basic understanding of the science. And it's not that it's not all that tough to get a get a basic uh, a basic clue about this. Although I mean I, I'll, I'll admit this whole presentation may be an example of the Dunning Kruger effect, which where someone knows so little about something they think they, they don't realize they don't know anything about it. But I'm hoping there's more questions than answers, but there are a lot of opportunities at least to think about things. Yes. If we uh Build a yacht out of wood instead of fiberglass. Uh, would you help them solve the problem? Well, the, um, my uh, my wooden sailboat was built the same year I was. Uh, I, I don't have it anymore, but the one I had was built the same year I was, so it sequestered a bunch of Norway pine for 50 years. Um, but yeah, I mean that's anything we can do with wood that lasts is great. And the point is, wood is still hard. To uh, the bacteria that have figured that out are not good at it. And uh, that's why we see wood buildings that are a thousand years old in Japan. So, um, and, you know, wood is actually a great material for earthquake resistance because unlike most materials, wood gets stronger as it gets high speed load. You know, the quick loads on wood are Wood is stronger for very high, high speed, short duration loads than other materials. Most materials are weaker for, for impact load. Wood is stronger. So, and another, the Amuse Bush presentation was on um, sustainable sailboats or sustainable boats, which were um, wood planking over steel. Doesn't, it doesn't use difficult to find uh, timbers. Steel is recyclable, sustainable, wood sequesters carbon, and eventually biodegrades. Fiberglass is forever. And unfortunately, it's made in oil. If we make fiberglass out of bio materials, maybe sailboat, you know, all those dead sailboats in the back of somebody's marina will be, look at carbon credits. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. You probably could. People who are looking into this are making carbon fiber out of all kinds of chemicals. And alginates are what kelp produces the things. And it probably is possible to spin a fiber out of an alginate and then cook it in a, uh, in a, in a kiln and make it into carbon fiber. That's how you make carbon fiber is you take a uh, uh, hydrocarbon and you cook it. And so, yeah, it might be possible to make carbon fiber out of some chemical in kelp, particularly uh, alginate, because they are moldable and so on in that, in that way. And there's a lot of work being done with transforming alginates into various things by various processes. Berkeley has uh, came up with a bioengineered uh, yeast that eats alginates and makes alcohol. Uh, so yeah, there's some possibilities. You, you have one. Yeah. Um, Well, the ocean energy, what happens when they do artificial kelp farming is they take the baby hold fast and they run a rope through it and then lay it on the ocean floor. Um, so a lot of the proposed structures are more or less an umbrella <coughs> with ropes, you know, and, you know, a bunch of spars sticking out with ropes running between them and then kelp on the ropes. Now, 
the real the big problem with them is you've got the cable dynamics of the rope and the cable dynamics of the fronds. And so if you get a good storm coming through that, the whole thing starts galloping and shedding fronds. So the traditional method of doing it, which is which is what they do for kelp farming, they set these things out and then lay them on the bottom. Taking that and transforming that into deep ocean work is probably not the best solution. We need to understand the dynamics of a cable with fronds on it better. And that's something why somebody could use Abacus Aqua or one of those fancy CFD programs to do. Um, so, yeah, that's how they do it now, but it doesn't necessarily work in, in deep water. We have to figure out better ways of doing that. So, if you've got some, it's possible that, for example, you might be able to put balls periodically on that um, cable, just like they do on high-tension power lines to interrupt the, and damp the motions of those cables. But this is an interesting area of um, an, um, an analysis for people who are interested in high-end high hydrodynamics. It would be a very interesting um, piece of work on the open foam on one of the other CFD programs. A lot of time on the computer, too. Any, any other 